Great. So I want to start today with a simple and sort of very old question, right, about universal biology. So for a long time, people have asked, is there such a thing as universal biology? It's been you know, the topic of the last two days here at this meeting, um, akin to the type of theories we have in physics and chemistry. So the great success of physics and chemistry um, is that you can go anywhere in the universe and these laws still apply. So this allows us to do astrophysics, cosmochemistry, um, solve lots of inter interesting problems by extrapolating from the laws that we learn here to larger scale observations and identify a set of laws that apply everywhere. And the question really, is there any hope for something like this in biology that would allow us to do things like recognize life anywhere in the universe, um, understand origins of life in general and how many different types of origins of life you might get, um, and, and think about questions in astrobiology. And so the way I think about this is that the challenge at hand is really to take this spectrum of thinking about things we know about extant life on our planet, combined with a set of abstract theoretical principles, boil those down into a, a more general set of principles about life, out of this build some universal theory of life, and then use this to do things like predict a whole family of potential origins of life, understand lots of things about ecology and evolution on our own planet, um, and then think about how to search for life in the universe and how we would recognize life in general. Um, and these two questions are really wide open because um, we even struggle with things in the middle from one theory of life. And so I think we have, at this far right end of the spectrum, already a lot of progress. Um, so some of the principles that David talked about yesterday, um, other things like um, the error threshold, which is just the maximum mutation rate you can have uh, given the length of a genome and the overall strength of selection in an evolutionary system, um, things like pattern formation, these are sort of the general types of things that we have on the abstract, more mathematical end of things. And we need to find some way to connect those to observed physiology and extant life, things like known genetic inheritance, and bring all this together to form some universal theory of life. And this may be impossible, um, which I'm coming to, but I think this is sort of the task at hand, um, at least from my perspective. So today I'll focus mostly on how we take what we know about extant life and begin to generalize some of these observations um, into more general principles. Um, a lot of these topics um, were covered yesterday, and I think at some point there needs to be a greater conversation between um, these types of things as has already come up. So um, is there hope for generalizing observations about life? I think we just heard from Jeffrey and Van um, that there, there is some hope, um, because if we look at the sort of largest scales of evolution, um, we see these overall systematic scaling laws. These tend to tell us that there seem to be a small set of constraints operating on all of life at the largest scales of evolution. There, there's some overall regularity of, of how life evolves, um, and so this is fairly impressive. And yet we also have to ask, how do we start to get to the variation, right? So how do we go from these first order trends or zeroth order trends to explaining lots of different types of variation um, across all of life? And so the, the thing to recognize in asking that question is really that this law um, is a specific case of a more general problem. And that more general problem is, if I think of an organism as having some set of traits, each of those traits um, must relate to some set of constraints in the environment, um, and then those traits get combined into particular body plans or particular species. And so what we have is how each trait responds then to a set of physical constraints across size, and then we combine all these together to get sort of the overall performance of an organism um, across size. And so what I mean by these scaling laws being a specific instance of this is that they occur in cases where a small set or maybe even one trait is most dominant for a species fitness um, or success across body size, and that one trait is very strongly connected to a small set or even a single constraint. Um, and so when you have that, um, you might get something that looks more like a scaling law across um, lots of different body sizes. But if you have a large number of traits that are sort of equally comparable to each other, dependent on a large number of physical constraints, um, you might get more complicated relationships. There might even be uh, maxima at particular body sizes telling you um, there's a best possible organism given a particular body plan um, or structure of an organism. <clears throat> 
Um, the other thing to note about these laws is that um, when you have a single trait related to a single constraint, um, there still should be some shift um, with scale that eventually starts to deviate from, from say, a power law relationship. So we should expect asymptotic features to show up um, as certain constraints become um, either exponentially limiting or go to zero or something like that. And so taken together, we expect then that as a function of either changes in size or shifts in architecture, we should see um, radical shifts in the scaling relationships. And that's in fact um, what we see if we look across some of the major evolutionary transitions in life. So this is going from bacteria to single cell eukaryotes to small multicellular life where we see that the metabolic rate scaling um, shifts uh, significantly as you go across each of these major evolutionary transitions. Uh, super linear in bacteria becomes roughly linear in the small unicellular eukaryotes and then settles down to this uh, three-quarter power scaling um, in small multicellular life. And so it's interesting to ask what constraints um, lead to these differences, um, and we're working on that. Another direction we can go is to take these as a given and ask what they predict about these different categories of life. Um, and one thing they predict are these shifts in the population growth rates across um, these three different categories, whereas the uni where the unicellular bacteria, um, and I'm not showing the theory that predicts these curves, um, but we have a nice mathematical theory, a lot of the framework that, that Jeffrey talked about actually. Um, and so in bacteria, you have this increasing growth rate with increasing size, so the bacteria are speeding up and metabolic rate with increasing size. The unicellular eukaryotes then decrease in metabolic rate with increasing size, and that continues um, all the way out to multicellular life. What's also nice about this, this theory is it predicts these asymptotic scales um, that I mentioned before. So there are distinct sizes where the growth rate um, is forced to go to zero. This is the point where the repair processes overtake the, the, overtake the biosynthesis processes, um, and you simply can't grow anymore. And this predicts a lower bound on bacterial size, which is held up very well um, based on some recent measurements of, of new, new world record holders in smallest bacteria. And it also predicts the scale at which you should transition from unicellular life to multicellular life because, again, the energetics become problematic. And you see that the growth rate goes to zero roughly at the scale where you stop seeing um, large unicellular eukaryotes and you start seeing small multicellular eukaryotes. And so by tracking these constraints and being careful about them, um, we can start to predict these higher order effects of evolution where you would have radical shifts in architecture um, as an example. Now you might ask looking at this plot, what happens here? Why aren't we all bacteria? So why did the bacteria transition to eukaryotes? Life seems to be getting better and better for them. They're growing really quickly. They have tons of metabolic power. Um, why do we see this shift in architecture? Um, and that comes from thinking about another set um, of physiological constraints. So this is now not related to energy, but more related to the specific structure and evolutionary history of these organisms. And if you're careful about understanding sort of what the internal macrophysiology of a species is, you can derive that the requirement for ribosomes, which are the main um, translational machinery of the cell, is uh, a small fraction of the total cell volume until you start to get up these very fast growth rates, and then this becomes asymptotic, and you have a point where you would need more ribosomes to support the cell than can physically fit inside the cell, and this basically sets a speed limit on the fastest possible cellular division time and tells you why you can't get larger than a certain size given this um, bacterial architecture. Um, and you can do this for all of the various um, macrophysiological aspects of the cell. So this is now sort of a trade-off diagram for uh, the bacterial architecture where you see sort of radical shifts in these different macrophysiological components and you see that cells run out of space at both the small and large end. So small bacteria are limited both by energetics and by physical space and large bacteria are roughly just limited by space due to this um, increasing speed of growth. And now this starts to be the place where we can really um, begin to generalize, because we like to take these specific trade-offs in macrophysiology and say, well, how would that be true for life anywhere? And so we can, we can start to think about that in terms of um, efficiency of genetic storage, um, how much translational machinery you need to go from code to function. 
Um, and as one example of that, um, here's a plot where we're looking at sort of the total volume of translational machinery you would need given radical slowdowns or speed ups. And so if you found a translational machinery in cells that was 10 times faster than the ribosome that was discovered by the life that we have, bacteria would be able to gain an extra two orders of magnitude in body size or cell size, which is impressive. And if you found translational machinery that was 40 times slower, you can't encapsulate life at all. So you should never expect to see um, encapsulated cells um, in such a world. Now this is holding lots of other aspects of the physiology constant. And so the question becomes, how do we start to generalize all of these things together to think about um, the how you form um, encapsulated life? And I think there's some hope there for, for forming at least some general theories about um, single cells. I also want to mention that we went one direction with this metabolic theory to start thinking about very detailed um, cellular physiology and dynamics. We can also go the other direction and start to build um, population models. This has already been mentioned several times this morning with, with the same sort of energetic principles, um, where if we have a population of uh, mammals on a landscape transitioning between being full and, and hungry and eventually dying, coupled to a resource where the full state can produce offspring and the hungry state can't, then we can do things like predict um, Damis law, um, which is nice and there's some there's been, for a long time, simple arguments about where this law comes from, but we can show that it emerges out of these dynamics coupled to the energetics. And I think more interestingly, we predict that in this space, there's another set of asymptotic behaviors where these larger mammals are driving the resource density lower and lower, um, which means they should have a competitive advantage, at least in a, a steady state environment, over smaller mammals. So this tells you something about Cope's rule, which is the tendency for lineages to get bigger over evolutionary time, um, up to a point, though, where these mammals would drive resources to zero, and this sets an upper bound on terrestrial mammal size, um, which we predict um, to be at this scale, and that agrees very well with the two largest uh, terrestrial mammals in the fossil record. Um, so again, I think once we start to, to couple these energetic considerations, with more detailed dynamics um, and think about where these asymptotics occur, we can get these higher order evolutionary predictions about things like the largest and smallest bacteria, the largest possible terrestrial mammal, um, so forth and so on. So coming back to this question of um, universal biology, um, I think another way to think about the spectrum that we have at hand is a lot of the things that I've talked about and that Jeffrey and Van have talked about are types of problems where the biology sits very close to the physical constraints. Um, and when that's true, for, for the questions where you can think about physical constraints being dominant, then you can drive these simple power laws and so forth. And there, but that's a certain set of questions. I think there are other types of questions that require, more, uh, require sort of higher order principles, much more similar to the types of evolutionary and Bayesian processes that, that David mentioned yesterday. And then I think there are further um, biological problems that are all about pure contingency. So an example of this would be uh, if you look at embryo development in humans, at some point you grow a tail um, that isn't necessary, it isn't eventually going to be used for function. Um, and the reason it's there um, is for purely historical reasons and presumably because there's not strong enough selection um, or a big enough effect of having that small tail during embryo development for evolution to get rid of that. So that's something that's not fully optimal for reasons that we understand um, and is based mostly on history. So I think we have to be careful in thinking about a universal principles in life, where our question lies in this space. Are we in, are we in the space where it's all about um, history and contingency, or are we really close to some pure physical constraint predicting the answer? Um, and I think we've seen over the last few days that lots of questions live sort of everywhere um, in this space. Um, and so with that, I think I'll answer this question by saying yes and no, both very strongly. So I think we can get universal biology in, in certain cases for certain types of questions. Um, in other cases, um, absolutely not, um, where things like our own particular evolutionary history matter most. Um, I want to thank a set of collaborators um, and a variety of funding sources. Um, and with that, um, yeah, I guess we can move into the, the question phase. So thank you.
Uh, thanks, that was uh, really thought-provoking. <laughs> um, I am wondering if you think that there's sort of a point in any uh, biological system or in the evolutionary history of any biological system where the fact that you know there are many of these entities and they're interacting with one another, they're now in an ecosystem, they're dealing with their environment, um, leads to sort of necessarily them needing to be able to evolve and that that is another kind of higher order constraint that's not exactly physical but I mean it's almost conceptual but it's a it's potentially a real constraint or whether that's sort of a an artifact of the way we think about things and like oh yeah there could be some planet with biology on it where it, you know it did some evolution because that just sort of happens but it never really evolved these sort of very highly general kind of mechanisms for evolving further yeah, I mean, I think I think a lot of that falls in that sort of mid-phase that I'm talking about. So I think absolutely you could get contexts where all of the constraints are emergent constraints of the ecology or the ecosystem that are very hard to predict ahead of time, and those begin to completely dominate over the physical constraints you had originally. So that, you know, things like niche construction, all, you know, lots of, you know, the other ideas we've talked about. So I think, yeah, there's definitely cases where you wouldn't call that physical and that those are the things you most need to think about. Just to follow up, I guess part of my question was, do you think that that inevitably occurs or that you could uh, have systems where you never get to that point? Oh, I think you could have systems where you never get to that point. Yes, yeah, so I think if you, if you had an uh, incredibly stable environment with a really dominant physical constraint, you should expect one species for all time. But that's, you know, th but that's, a, that's a very strong condition to have that happen, yeah. 